Um, my thanks to uh, both the GEF and to the Heinz Center uh, for convening this and uh, Tom to you and your staff colleagues for bringing out uh, what clearly is an important issue at a particularly critical time. Um, Dr. Rishi reminded us that apparently boundaries are closed by and are being approached at almost reckless pace. And uh, the problem is multidimensional, not just because the boundaries are many, but also because the causes are complex. And therefore, it's not surprising that we need to search complex solutions. Um, I'll begin. I'll begin by uh, summarizing, uh, if you like, the recent history of the case on uh, on climate change. But I want to go quickly on to the uh, the key issues, which, in my opinion, have been neglected for too long and particularly the role of the private sector and particularly the interdependencies that we have uh, between the problems that we face. So whilst I speak about the economics of climate change, an area that has been well researched and well presented, <coughs> in fact, I want to open up a few doors of thinking for you into the direction of the private sector and of these interdependencies and of the nature of these complex solutions that we need to solve our complex problems. First, a quick uh, assessment of where we stand. I think uh, it still remains the greatest challenge uh, facing humanity. This is straight from your report. And as Stern, Lord Stern reminded us, we have it in our hands to overcome these problems through policy, through collaboration, and through a more far-sighted approach. And I think none of that, what was said earlier, has, has really uh, changed. In fact, he said this in his foreword to my book called Cooperation 2020. And earlier he had written in his, in his introduction to the review that what we do in the next 10 or 20 years can have a profound effect on the climate in the second half of this century. In fact, it was the comments of Lord Stern and of Pichori and others on boundaries such as climate, such as phosphorus, uh, that have made me think that we really have no more than a decade, and that we are in the beginning of that decade. We already have spent two of those years of that decade to really achieve significant change in economic direction and resource use. If we want to achieve a solution to our problems, we have to recognize that timeline and take it seriously. The costs have gone up, but then that's exactly what the Stern Review had forecast, that as against the original 1%, uh, of course it was always an average of the range, it was minus 1 to 3.5%, but 1% was the, the headline figure that you need to spend a percent of GDP in order to save yourself future costs of 5% to 20% of GDP. Uh, but the law's term has gone up to 2%. And I think of late he has been saying that not only were the scientific assessments of the uh, damage impacts uh, of the rate of climate change underestimated at the time the review was written in 2006, but at the same time uh, the damage impacts from the changing climate were also underestimated. And thirdly, there were three dimensions of underestimation. The economic impacts of the damage impacts that were also underestimated. So Lord Stern, if you speak with him today, will himself say that his numbers were underestimated. But that's normal. When we are engaging a scientific uh, study, you tend to err on the side of caution. But all that's happening is that the floor that was set by caution has now been raised for basically three reasons. And the costs have begun to be visible and palpable. And there, there are studies which have estimated the cost due to uh, lost productivity and, and health. And, and the actual loss of lives to of the order of 1.2 trillion. So when we talk about spending 1.5 trillion per annum, let me size it as follows. The firstly, is 2% of GDP, which again is close, very close to what the Green Economy Report had commented, that you need to invest in the green economy. It's also not far away from the trillion of dollars of subsidies that we still have in our system today where we are supporting exactly the opposite of the green economy. Because we have $650 billion, that is an estimate from the International Energy Agency 2009, of subsidies for fossil fuels, 550 billion of price subsidies, 100 billion of production subsidies. We still have $275 billion of subsidies for agriculture, mostly for intensive agriculture. And we still have $31 billion of subsidies for fisheries and then of course transportation and so on. So there's about hundred trillion dollars of subsidies which are at present supporting the current economic model. The football field on which business today plays is not a level playing field. 
So do we expect them to push a green economy when you're actually pointing them in the direction of a brown economy? Does not make great sense. So that's the first point here, that we need to look at the cost, but see them in the context. We are already wasting a trillion of dollars of your taxes and mine. I think the challenge here is how do we get the recognition of that and recognize that what's needed not is more money, but money spent better. Now the money that is available, and that of course includes the resources of the GEF, the GEF's uh, approximately $15 billion of historical funding and uh, the last few uh, uh, trust fund replenishments are all part of this $30 billion of, dollars of estimated uh, available finance. But the challenge is this, here's $30 billion, and on the other hand, what do we have? We have a brown economy, which is quite significant. And how significant is that? Well, let's look at what's driving this brown economy, which is the engine. The agent of today's economy is the corporation. It is the private sector. Uh, we are here in the US, where if you look at the, <coughs> the extent of the private sector in the economy, it's 74%, 75% of GDP and another 74% of jobs. So the majority of the economy is private sector. Globally, these numbers are 60% and 70%. So we're talking about uh, the elephant in the drawing room being the private sector. And if today's private sector is pushing the economy in the direction of resource use that we don't want because it is hitting planetary boundaries, then we need to get our heads around the need to change the way the private sector is incentivized and operates in today's economy. Um, uh, my, my thanks and apologies for the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation because this is a slide I used first for them. But I was trying to explain to them what should they do with their money. And I'm not suggesting that uh, to Dr. Ishii that this is exactly the same as what the GDF should do. But my point is this, that you are a, a small tug, let's say, in, in the case of the GDMF. We estimated in the room that between them and the entire West Coast, approximately a billion dollars of philanthropic funding for the environment. Let's take another billion dollars of the rest of the world, two billion dollars of philanthropic funding. So there was this little tub trying to pull desperately hard against the super tanker, which is heading for a crash, and that's a $44 trillion super tanker because it's basically 70% of a $70 trillion economy. And what do you think was going to happen? Well, I think the answer is clear crash as expected. But there's another way of looking at this, which is instead of pulling desperately hard in the opposite direction. What if the tug went up to the nose of the super tanker and instead pulled very hard, 90 degrees? What could happen is that you could change the direction of the super tanker. So instead of going into the direction of the brown economy, you might head it into the direction of the green economy. That would be much better use of those two billion dollars. Change the direction. Don't try to oppose the flow. I think that's the basic message here. Now, how do you change direction? I and mean, if we are talking about the corporation as being the agent, the main agent of today's economy, what do you need to do to change the direction of today's corporation, which is created for profits? It will seek profits at the expense of all else. It will create externalities. We are going to come up, when I say we, the T for Business Coalition, which has been collectively working together, and of course this includes the GF and many of the institutions who are represented here. We are putting together a lot of data and information on what are the major business externalities. Uh, in a month or so, you will see the report which lists the top 100. For instance, it will show you, for example, that uh, cattle ranching in Latin America is the third largest externality in, in a couple of hundreds of billions of dollars. Not just that, but what's significant is that its cost to society in terms of and methane emissions and deforestation and so on is almost 18 to 20 times the size of the value that the sector has. The ratios are not as startling, I'm giving you just the most startling results, but the ratio is quite bad when it comes to coal fired electricity because, for example, in Eastern Asia or for that matter in North America, it may add 350 or 350 billion dollars of value in terms of net value of that sector generating energy, but it would cost society in terms of climate emissions, human health costs, and building damage of the order of one and a half times as much. So these are very significant realities which we need to first absorb, recognize, transmit out to the sector's concern, transmit into the policy making space, and then start formulating what I believe are actually the change makers of tomorrow. And I say tomorrow, with the limit on 2020. These change makers are micro policy changes. 
We need to change the way that corporations report profits. It's not sufficient to calculate just the value that you add for shareholders. You need to calculate the total value that you add or subtract for stakeholders. This may have been complex five years ago and impossible to do ten years ago, but today, ladies and gentlemen, it can be done and has been done. And a few leading corporations have already shown the difference. So what's needed between in this space is bridging the gap between the leadership that has been demonstrated to the followership, in other words, to the rest of the system. But this alone, in other words, getting your, getting your measurement of success right, will not alone solve the problem. What you also need is to address the other key drivers. Now, we mentioned demand side. I think we need to look at that. And we need to look at advertising as a key driver of the demand side. How much effort and energy is spent in advertising in a $500 billion industry whose voice is much sugar and much louder than the size is only a fraction of the global economy? But it's significant in terms of the impact. It's 24 by 7 impact in the way we think and behave. Okay. Advertising impinges on our subconscious cells, converts our insecurities into wants, wants into needs, needs into demand, demand into production, and that's what's easy in sports cycle. And how do we concern, how do we limit ourselves to that? How do we keep advertising ethical and informative? How do we make it focus on aspects which should be disclosed, such as the longevity of the project product, its provenance, whether it comes from a conflict location or not? It's, it's value to us, and it's alternatives, and it's disclosure instructions. None of that actually ever comes through in the branding or, or in, the, in the actual wrapping of the product. All you get here is like how wonderful this is and how you can replace it in six months' time, or even three if you like. Um, so we need to change that, and that change is in the hands of associations or advertisers when it can be worked on. We need to change the way we tax. We are always focusing on taxing the goods and not the tax. Ladies and gentlemen, we are still in a recessionary environment. We still haven't had labor, which is a lagging indicator. We haven't had that. But how can we expect to manage our finances as governments? How can we expect that if we are constantly focusing in a recessionary environment on income taxes when unemployment is right and, and, and new jobs are scarce, and focusing on corporation taxes when demand is in recession and profits are under pressure due to competition? Why do we focus on declining pies to tax in order to gain our revenues? Why not focus on aspects such as resource use? And that, of course, includes the atmospheric resource use and therefore carbon taxes. We need to look at how governments are going to finance themselves over the next few years and at the same time look at their environmental impacts. And I think we come interestingly to the same conclusions that we are in a situation where we are shrinking tax bases, and if we continue to tax the way we do today, we are creating two problems, fiscal and fiscal management, as well as environmental costs. And finally, and last but not the least, since uh, some of you may know my origins are in finance and the bank, banking also has its share of the problems, because we underestimate the cost of this free lunch that we provide to corporations so that if they can over leverage and create uh, a, a social cost, it kind of gets externalized because governments pick up costs and then finally our taxes pay for them. And we need to stop that asymmetry where profits belong to the company and losses because they're too big to pay belong to us. So these are some of the issues which we need to look at, which are all what I would call micro policy issues. And I think going there, in addition to looking at the interconnectedness of, of the challenges that we face, is really going to give us some.